Folks, welcome back. My name is Rudy. You're watching Alpha Investments. Today, um, another Q&A answer video. Rudy, we do a background discussion of your bookcase and actually discuss and reveal the history and go through the items in the bookcase. Most people on this channel weren't around over all the years and they don't know the stories of the items, the booms, the busts. So this entire video, we're literally going to go through the bookcase, talk about the stories, the videos, because there's over 3,000 videos in this YouTube channel. This YouTube channel is eight years old now. There's so many things that have happened. I know the average viewer and the average lifespan of a cardboard collectible individual is usually between the ages of 20 and 40 years old, and you usually stay in this market or watch my videos for maybe three months to a year before people's life events change. People change you know, industries, they lose interest in cards, maybe a bear market, they, they get hosed by Rudy, or you know, I take their stepsister. Something usually happens. So most of you all watching aren't aware of this massive history behind me. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go through it, and I'm going to talk about stories and things that you have never realized have taken place on this channel. So we're going to start right out of the gate, shall we? Let's start in the top left corner. Up here, we have big box copies of Diablo 2. Can you guys see that way up there? So up there, we have Diablo 2 in the expansion that I used to play 20 years ago. Oh my god, I don't know. Um, I was a big Blizzard Entertainment fan of the StarCraft, WarCraft, WarCraft 2, Diablo, Diablo 2, and yes, even Diablo 3 in the auction house until everything went to hell. And I have not played Diablo 4 because I'm older. My work schedule, my work-life balance with family, my son and everything, and my woman. I don't really have time to enjoy video games. And I really miss playing a lot of video games. But the reason Diablo 2 was there is because Diablo 2 to me is a symbolic item that represents a piece of art that was made in an industry, video games, that was so beautifully done, it deserves to always be remembered in the back of your mind. Diablo 2 is such an in-depth, creative, balanced, and an amazing journey for the average person to experience. It's just, anyone who's serious about adventures, collectibles, perspectives, I think Diablo 2 is almost like a, like a must-have or a must-play experience in life. And I don't mean a few minutes. You have to literally play it enough to experience the journey, not just, oh, five minutes, no, it's a click it, action RPG. No, 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 you have to experience it. And that means you have to, I would recommend maybe seven days minimum of a couple hours a day to get really deep into it, understand the end game, understand the adventure and the difficulties, how the skill trees, how the system works. It's very important. That's, we're going to start right there. Next, we're going to move over to this. There was a fake Black Lotus up here um, that somebody had sent to me complaining that PSA had not graded their Black Lotus, and the Black Lotus was real. So, and then the Rudy Rush thing, can you guys, make sure you guys can see that. So the Rudy Rush above it is symbolic of the scam from, <laughs> actually, one of my original $100 patrons back in 2017 who turned on me because I wouldn't sell the infamous beta Black Lotus to this individual. And unfortunately, I should have kept it, but I sold it to a different friend of mine who still has it, and I've offered to buy it back from him, and he won't, even at a higher price, he wouldn't sell it to me. Anyways, so we have a fake Black Lotus that PSA rejected grading. But the Rudy Rush is probably one of the most fascinating stories from about six years ago. And that was when on one of my 500 videos of collection buying, video number 283, I bought a big magic collection from a World Poker Tour or a World Poker Magic Player. Okay, And in that collection, one of the pieces of Power 9 was a Beta Black Lotus with the Christopher Rush signature, and the C had more sharper corners. And after doing research on it, I felt confident enough that the signature was real in that many years ago. No one's going to risk damaging and faking a signature on a card like a Black Lotus that many years ago. And after finding other similar examples with almost identical hard corners on the C, um, I actually bought the collection, and that one particular card was in the collection. And because of that, um, to advertise my YouTube channel, I used to put a lot of silly eBay listings up of really overpriced Pokemon, Magic, Million Dollar Arabian Night, silly stuff, right? And I had that Lotus on there. And out of nowhere, 
all of a sudden, some people who hate me on, of course, you know, social media, started posting on Reddits and Discords and Facebook about how I was forging and selling fake signatures and all that stuff. So it became a huge meme and joke on the channel five, six years ago. So everybody now knows, oh, here it is. Here's the Rudy Rush, the Christopher Rush, Rudy Rush thing. And um, that was kind of the story of it. And nothing really happened or anything except people just leveraged that to get very angry on the internet. And I, my biggest regret of that story is I should have kept the card. It was a beta Black Lotus. And back then, and with all the controversy, I was I went through this, this fail. I was so pissed off of just patron messages and random comments. Everybody just talked about Rudy and fake signatures. And it was so irritating because no matter what we'd talk about or open, people like... There were some people who thought I literally had an entire counterfeit signature operation in Florida. Other people thought I only deal in fake. It just, it became stupid. And I ended up being so pissed about it. I ended up selling the card for a couple grand, the Beta Lotus, to a friend of mine. And I've tried to buy it back for like double, but I, I wish I kept the card, honestly. Because it's a real Lotus and it had a real signature. And I wish I had kept it. That's my biggest regret of it. So that's the story of the Rudy Rush, which is the Chris Rush. Because... A long time ago, I was going to make a video of me in like this hidden room. I was going to do like a dark video with like a first person shooter point of view and like going through it. And then you find this dark basement room and you open it with a flashlight. And there was going to be me sitting at a desk and I was going to cover the whole room with me signing Chris Rush signatures. And like you caught me. I was going to make this dramatic like uh, kind of independent silly film about it. Um, but then right at that time, the, the Patreon, YouTube and the business went crazy and I had a huge spike. And I shelved the idea. I never got to make that adventure video. So that was where the Rudy Rush came from. The Christopher Rush and the Rudy signature. And it was a funny story. So next to it, um, this is an Electrify Flesh and Blood exclusive promo that I actually put in the background before the promo card was ever revealed to the public to see if anyone ever noticed. And nobody ever did. It was sitting there for like a month before it was ever even revealed. And it was just funny. And I was like, it just showed me how... The lack of attention to detail for the average person in modern times. Nobody pays attention to anything anymore. I used to do a lot of fun hidden bookshelf and like moving things around and hiding things. Um, the problem was the people just didn't pay attention. Nobody noticed it and I stopped doing it. I know some of you all, maybe old school people remember me doing that. But it just people stopped doing it and nobody paid attention to anything and it kind of wasn't very motivating to me when nobody noticed any changes. Does that make sense? So that was that. Obviously, below that, we got Beanie Baby, um, which I purchased this on eBay, the $4, because I want to do a, a conversation on uh, Funko Pops. Do I have my Funko, a Rudy Funko? Oh, there's a F Rudy Funko behind here. Hold on. Yeah. So behind here, we have the Rudy Funko Pop. So I, I consider Funko Pops the modern-day Beanie Babies. I've never liked them. I have friends who love Funko Pops, collect them, have roomfuls of Funko Pops, I don't like Funko Pops. I've never liked them. I consider them Beanie Babies 2.0. The company who makes them, there are warehouses with millions and they're just, they're, I don't see the utility. I don't like how people grade and seal the condition of the box on literally a little piece of plastic. There's no utility. There's no unique cards. There's no, I, I just, I just don't like it. So that is that. That's why I bought my $4 Beanie Baby right there. Next we have... <clears throat> Um, let me put this stuff on. Obviously, next, I guess we'll talk about um, when I started to discuss and reveal publicly that I've been putting money into Legos. Uh, one, of the, one of you all viewers uh, actually sold me. They went to the special developer conference, and they had this exclusive little Lego thing, and I bought it, and I thought it was a fun little thing. It's just a cute little like Lego developer exclusive thing, and you know that's all that really is there. I thought it was just a really uh, neat thing. Uh, behind here, we got the world-famous Sarah Angel with the broken wing here. Um, for me throwing things years ago and breaking stuff, uh, I broke it, never really fixed it or anything. And at the very beginning of this channel, in 2016-17 range, we used to have Sarah Angel, uh, Sir Wolf's a lot, which I don't know where he is. Is he still here? I think he's gone. Sir Wolf's fault maybe fell to his doom. Of course, we have the Greed Monster, which was also a viewer who sent me this little plushy pig thing from, I don't know, Angry Birds or some silly thing from years ago. So that became a thing at the very beginning. And we used to hide Sarah Angel. And we used to hide the Greed Monster in the videos. For the, like, there's like 200 videos on this YouTube channel from 2016 through 18. Where every video, no matter where I filmed, I hid Sarah Angel somewhere in the video's background. And I hid the Greed Monster somewhere in the background of the video. 
So there's a lot of videos from back in the day. I hid in every, no matter where I filmed, the different locations, I would take those items and I hid Sarah Angel in the greed monster somewhere in the background of the video. People stopped looking. Nobody noticed. I got tired of doing it when nobody cared. It was very um, demoralizing and lack of motivation. It just didn't... It, I enjoyed it. So I used to enjoy a lot of fun, playful things like that. As time went on, uh, the channel grew. It seemed like that small ecosystem of viewers, everybody comes and goes, nobody cared. It just kind of is what it is. Now, uh, next up over here, we've got the old school fancy uh, collectible books back there. Uh, mostly because those books represent the history and a lot of amazing storytelling and a lot of amazing pieces of culture and art. And I always thought it was a nice philosophical thinking piece. The books don't have that particular row of books. It doesn't have a lot of symbolism besides, you know, Odyssey, Hans Christian Andersen, H.G. Wells. Of course, Arabian Nights, my favorite. You've got some little Vampire Chronicles. You've got some William Shakespeare, Narnia, great, you know, just basic stuff. Nothing too crazy on the books on that particular row. Now, next to it, we do have, we have the burnt Arabian Nights pack from the very beginning of the YouTube channel where I used to light things on fire, light fireworks here inside the office, and we literally just burnt an Arabian Nights pack. That, that it's literally, it's it's a burnt Arabian Nights pack. I, you know, it's just, it's been there a long time. Um, next, we have the Rule of Rose, and this is similar to the video game, oh my god, it's covered in dust now. You guys see the dust? So Rule of Rose is a very interesting thing. So before the boom, of the VGA graded and the WADA graded games, um, I was always, I'm a huge, huge PS1, PS2 era RPG, action RPG, Atlas, Square Soft before it was Square Onyx or Square Enix. You know, I was a big fan um, of a lot of these working designs, a lot of these old, rare RPGs. Some of the best, most amazing skills of video games, programmers, storytelling is in some of these old things. Some are very rare and impossible to find, and I like to collect them. Um, and yes, I do have a video game investment division that I do quietly on the side with substantial, you know, 20, 30 copies of Final Fantasy VII, 10 copies of Final Fantasy VIII. Um, let's see here, Ogre Battle, Tactics Ogre, Xeno Gears, Einhander, a bunch of copies of all original black labels, sealed labels, unopened copies, Y-fold seams, Stuff like that. I just, again, it was something I enjoyed. It makes me happy. Reminds me of hardware media and, you know, physical media before this digital garbage era of microtransactions started. Uh, next, similar. Same thing right here. We have, again, covered in dust. We've got our h -Seam NES Nintendo with the nice little tag on the back of Wall Street Kid unopened original Nintendo video game. Because, you know, I just, I remember seeing this as a kid and I was like, oh my God, look at can you imagine all the, the money and business and the lifestyle? I was like, I was always intrigued um, by the whole financial world. And what intrigued me the most about finance, everybody, is not more so the raw money. It was the culture behind it and how we live in, we live in a society. It intrigued me how 90% or 99% of humans in the United States have a bad relationship with money. 99% of people in the United States view money where you get the money and it's like that's how much you can spend for the month. It wasn't until I was older it actually had some sort of real education in finance and training at brokerage firms and some large companies is that I've had some very wealthy people around me who taught me things that I even realized how stupid I was with money and how I didn't have a good relationship with money. And when these individuals taught me, Rudy, coming into money or making money is not a green light to spend and buy 15 Lambos and Bugattis and everything. What it told me was when you come into money, money won't make you happy, but you have to use that money as a utility to allow you to make different choices that you normally couldn't make. And those choices can lead you to better happiness and better quality of life. And that's what really opened my eyes where, okay, if I make $1,000, if I make a million dollars, if I make $10 million, you know, what you do with that money is what's going to dictate the direction of your life. That money becomes your employees. 
every brick or every block of ten thousand dollars is a worker. Okay, it, I can leverage that ten thousand into something making five percent interest, or into a bond, or into a stock long term that pays a dividend and has growth, or into a collectible that I feel in ten years will at least do something. You learn that the money becomes the worker bee for you. And that's how I started to rewire my relationship with money versus when I was a kid and I had 300 bucks. Please, mom, take me to the store. I need to buy five packs of fourth edition and Ice Age. You know, when I was a young Timmy, it was, it's important because I realized the substantial difference in my perspective and that helped me a lot. So that's where things like that come in. Similar to over here, we have the old 1980s Charlie Sheen, the infamous original Wall Street movie, where again, not my favorite movie of all time, Actually, my personal favorite movies of all time are actually movies like Thomas Crown Affair um, with Pierce Brosnan. And of course, uh, I did like the original Matrix and stuff like that. And then some weird movies and a lot of Stanley Kubrick and a lot of the, you know, Ocean's Eleven movies. I was a huge Ocean's fan. Um, just a lot of different things that really make you think. Kind of like that. You know, movies that make you question things are movies that always really get my attention. I'm not a fan. And again, when I was younger, I loved Marvel movies and superhero stuff. When I got older, I liked the critical thinking stuff. The stuff that makes me step back and say, wait a minute, I thought I knew everything. I thought I understood the world, the money, people, what makes people do stuff. That cockiness of, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm smart. I know what I'm doing. And then when I got older, I really leaned into the things that I didn't know. I like to learn. I like to sit back. and So I don't comment on videos. I don't do a lot of I don't really attack other content creators. I don't make videos responding to other people unless it's some have-to-do thing. I like to sit back and just watch and try to learn of why they feel that way. What is going through their life to make them think that? Perspective is such a powerful thing. Just listening and watching everyone else. The power of knowledge is so unbelievably powerful. So, continue forward over here. Here's a good Can you guys see the Amun Kitty Cat box? Okay, so the Amun Kitty Cat... Amonkhet Invocations box. GCF. This was the good card frame box. So this is, it should be empty, yeah. So this was a box that we did years ago when Amonkhet came out. And the frames of the, the lottery cards were so bad, you couldn't read the card. And there were so many people talking about why did Wizards choose the worst possible card frame for Amonkhet. Masterpiece lottery cards. So the joke was, they must have taken all the ideas, put them in some box... And gone with the shittiest possible thing and used the terrible card frame. And inside of this box, it was videos from six, seven years ago, were all the good ideas. And we filled it with condoms because they screwed all the good ideas and they went with the bad idea. So this was kind of a funny meme from a long time ago that I don't think most people remember. And then you have, obviously, 1984. The book about the future, the government, everything's tracked in silliness. And you really can't do anything because the mega powerful billionaires are going to rule the world and it's a very symbolic cultural book that is honestly disturbing and scary but it's important to understand things whether you agree with people or not being aware of it is the most important that's kind of my personal thing next we come over here we do have more graded currency so obviously uh, i'm a big fan of graded currency what they call large notes of federal reserve currency not really a fan of like Confederate Civil War American currency because there's a lot of counterfeits, not as much collectability and value. But I'm a big fan of actual like U.S. large notes currency from like silver certificates, gold certificates. This is called like an educational certificate. It's a one dollar bill from 1896, and they, it's just the beauty and art. It's a crossover again to like Thomas Crown Affair, old paintings and artwork because old currency. The art on this stuff. Can you guys see it? The old, the art that they put into these engravings was just was just off the chart. It was an amazing, amazing thing. Um, over here, we do have some bricks. Oh, God. Some bricks of actual silver. Um, <laughs> I sold a friend of mine uh, some flesh and blood cases, and he paid me in bricks of silver. So I have some... Whew, that's heavy. Some actual bricks of silver. I don't want to break anything. So we have some actual bricks of silver. Um, this was a beta booster pack. Again, same thing. We messed it up, burned it, and screwed around with it. That's really about it. So actual bricks of silver. Uh, there's a book right here. Can you guys see that book? So that book right here, 
And it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. So this book was actually recommended to me and very intriguing to me. And this book is very special to me because this was the, this was the Innovator's Dilemma was the book that James from Legend Story Studios in New Zealand, the creator of Flesh and Blood, one of his favorite books, and told me I had to read it a long time ago. So not only did I check it out, I bought the book, read it, I keep it here as symbolism to think about complexities of life. Innovator's Dilemma. So that's where that particular one is right there. Over here in the middle, we've got the Shadows Over Innistrad tie. When I used to do silly stuff, like build a jacket out of Eternal Masters wrappers. Um, I wore a tie of Shadows of Innistrad. Try to look professional to Hasbro and Wizards. Maybe they listen to me. Uh, kind of funny. This is the, which is kind of funny. Uh, this thing's moved around so many times. But then one time I accidentally put this little Rudy Fina repacked H2O. This little piece of paper here where we made fun of repacks, I ended up putting in the middle after it fell many times. And then after I stuck it here in one video, a bunch of comments said, Oh, Rudy's so smart, he puts a fake play button in the middle of his video to make people click on it. So it was a complete accident. It was hilarious. So I've left it here ever since because people think it's a fake play button to help my views or manipulate the system. It's fucking hilarious. So uh, the Rudy Fina was based on right here. You guys see this right here? Was based on the Rudy Fina, which is uh, bottled water, which was repacks. When I did the repack thing a long time ago, on when I was talking about eBay, would make these repacks. And I just was never a fan of it, so we made fun of it. And I said, well, let's just repackage water and call it Rudy Fina. And that's where that meme came from many, many years ago. Right here, obviously, the iconic Masters. Masters 25 was our first example that Wizards could produce premium products that would fail. Before this, we never had a premium Magic product fail. Never happened. Okay? Modern Masters, Eternal Masters, Modern Masters 2015, 2017. All these Master sets came out. And they were just pure money and gold. And unfortunately, as with everything with corporate America, Hasbro, and these dumbasses, they destroy things. It's a mind-blowing thing, but they destroy everything. I don't know why. It's just always been that way. Hasbro, even when they find good things and they figure out a new era, they somehow find a way to fucking destroy it. And that's where that came from. Uh, Rubik's Cubes. Um, I just went through a phase where I was obsessed with Rubik's Cubes. I got a bunch of different cubes and everything and cubing. And I used to love learning the algorithms and the patterns to actually solve the bottom and do the certain things and go about it. I was never really into the timing of things, but it was uh, I, I enjoyed it. I always thought Rubik's Cubes were interesting because it tells you... Because people who don't know what a Rubik's Cube is, never handle one, and all they think of is a certain way of doing things, they just think, oh, I'll just, I'll just crack it. I'll just keep turning and I'll, I'll figure it out and everything. Well, let me... It doesn't really work that way. Rubik's Cubes are... Cubing is a whole weird world. I encourage you to look into if you're fascinated by stuff like that. Uh, but cubing is a world of algorithms. And it's a very interesting thing that you can learn from. And you realize that no matter how hard you try in life, if you don't know the algorithm and you don't know what you're doing... You know, if you don't know what you're doing, you cannot sit here and just go... There's no way, you know, if you don't know the code, you will never get there, no matter how hard you try. You have to know what you're doing. So, that's the interesting thing with Rubik's Cubes. That's why it's kind of there. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of symbolism for the world, okay? Um, these are interesting. So, these, a viewer, one of you all out there, send me these things, like, once or twice a year. These, these little shadow box things. Can you guys see this? I mean, can you guys see this? So, a viewer, you'll know, make these things. These 3D things of, like, all of you all watching me, and me and a whiteboard, this one's about choices in life. So I have a viewer who makes these things, and it's really interesting. Here's another one that we did in, uh, at a, a Flesh and Blood event where a bunch of us were around doing, like, the round table or the, the little horseman videos and stuff. So he, like, I'm not sure the story if he sells these things, but it's a really cool thing. So here's another interesting one where I'm over here, I guess I'm the salesman. I'm talking about Friday Night Magic and Flesh and Blood and MetaZoo and there's a bunch of tables, maybe an LGS or something. It's just, I don't know, I don't know the full story. Like, if you made these and you're, dude, you should be making a website selling stuff like this. This is really cool. Uh, people, for like 10, 20 bucks, people would probably, if you could sell those cheaply, 
people would buy those things, man. Um, another thing over here, again, another burnt, destroyed pack of old magic. Um, we have, um, there was um, a, a, this, this girl, I don't know if she still does it. So this Domino channel, this other YouTube channel, where she was doing custom booster boxes. This was a flesh and blood, I don't even know what box it is, I don't remember. It's a sealed flesh and blood box. And she would do custom art on the booster boxes for people. And I remember, I think her YouTube channel was like Domino YouTube or something. I don't know if she's still around or anything. Because again, when we go through these crashes and bear markets, people leave. People change. Life events. People move on in their life. And, you know, I'm one of the few idiots that I stay with everything. So, yeah, her name was Sarah. She made this in 2021. Very sweet girl. Beautiful girl. And um, this lady is just, this woman is... She's very talented. I don't know if she makes these or sells these. I'm not sure what the deal is. So anyways, that's Sarah. I don't know if you're still around, Domino. Um, anyways, let's keep going over here. Uh, the Zelda games. So here's a... Oh, here's... Well, here you guys go. Another... This is actually... Okay, here's the wood chopper. Not wood chipper. Here's the wood chopper. I'll hold it so you guys can see it better. So this is one of my um, bank notes. Again, I always love gem uncirculated, just like PSA 10. These, this scale goes up to 70, but I like the 65 level because it's not too crazy. This is a $5, uh, what they call the wood chopper guy with a dog, and he's kind of chopping wood. $5, 19.07, $5 bill, and it's absolutely gorgeous, dude. Again, it goes back into the artwork, my old paintings, old magic cards. Just, they don't put effort and beauty into mass-produced things anymore, and I love a lot of this kind of stuff. So behind here, we have also the world famous. So we have some of these old factory sealed Zeldas. This is by VGA. I never liked WADA games. I don't own any WADA stuff. Um, I bought these for around four or $500 each. I understand they're worth probably $5,000, $10,000. At the peak, they were $50,000, some stupid shit. I bought them because, again, um, oh, God, you guys see the sticker on the side here? You guys see that? Look, hold on. Western Auto, $39.99. How wild is that? There's our gorgeous H seal, right going in the middle there, factory seal. Um, the reason I bought this is because, again, when I was a kid, um, the original Zelda was something that my mom and I, we played and we did we, we enjoyed it together. And there's something beautiful about some of these old NES games that will never be duplicated. Because, again, this was an era. There was no fancy computer graphics. There was no crazy AI and technology. If you want to make a good video game, you had to truly put it into the story, the feel, the controls. Nowadays, all these big companies put these flashy graphics in movies and cutscenes. But the game itself sucks. It may lure you in with all these crazy colors and noises or hot jiggly chicks and fun things, but the game sucks. In this era, you didn't have a choice. You had to make a good game. That was the only option. So, I loved it. Same thing, I know, I know, Zelda 2, Link, everybody hated it, side-scrolling, I loved it. Okay, next, let's move on to the uh, other side of here. Uh, obviously, we got the Rubik's Cube thing. Uh, up here, we got the Carta Munde, old print sheets. Um, I was responsible, when I was tracking print runs and print sheets and things, after I went public with these Carta Munde sheets all over pallets, I saved hundreds of these things and started doing tracking from different stores around the country, and you all were sending me pictures. Um, Carta Munde and Wizards of the Coast got so angry, they stopped doing this. Completely. Ever since that blew up years ago on my channel, these disappeared. Kind of a funny thing, huh? Uh, Pogs, again, boom and bust, Beanie Babies. Pogs, very symbolic. Funko Pops, Beanie Babies, stuff like that, right? Uh, stop Tape. <laughs> stop Tape was a funny thing because there's a bunch of Timmies in the world that say, Oh, Rudy, I won't buy a case of magic if the Stop Tape isn't, isn't sealed. And again, Stop Tape is one of the dumbest things that Timmies and new people fall for because Stop Tape... Is simply put, you can buy rolls of it online for five ten dollars, and it's just people who view factory sealed in value on stop tape and generic cardboard is just hilarious to me. That's all. It's just that's all. That's the stop tape story. Here's a here's a good one. Here, so the five dollar Rudy Polaroid picture. Right? Okay, I gotta tell you all. Can you guys see that? Okay, the five dollar Rudy Polaroid. That's a good story. So in Las Vegas, twenty eighteen, I think it might have been the last time <clears throat> I went to a magic convention. Before everybody started hating Rudy. That was the cool thing to do. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I should go to these things. Like, safety risk. My family was like, I don't know. There's a lot of hate in the world. So, the $5 Polaroid was when I went to a magic event. There was a, another, there was a lady there who was a photographer. And she was 
offering people to take Polaroids and print it out in person and give it to you. And, and, just, and you know, and for $5, you can take pictures with me and other people there and you can hold any of the items from the background of the bookcase and I'd sign it for you and she would give, she would print out the picture and give it to people. I didn't get any money for it or anything. I guess I should have split it. But, you know, it was something nice. I thought people really enjoyed it. And they did. Apparently, I think, God, I think 100, 200 people probably did it. Anyways, um, as in true social media fashion, by the time I got home to Florida, you know, I started to get messages from people saying that everybody's attacking Rudy and the new thing, his new scam was that he's trying to steal the money from children and families by charging them for pictures. So then everybody started to attack me because this photographer was taking pictures and I would sign the pictures and I was in the pictures. So everybody thought I was trying to charge a bunch of money and steal people's money for children and kids that were there. I didn't know it became a thing, but it became a, it blew up into this big thing. And it was the new thing that they were using as pitchforks to try to cancel and ban Rudy. So that was the last time um, I also went to a magic event and... Um, I learned at that moment after, this was after the Chris uh, Rudy Rush fake signature thing. Uh, this was before the Rudy tried to manipulate the Mythic Edition War of the Spark. And this was in between that scam or scandal. I don't know which scandal this was. And I remember that. And I remember thinking, wow, I really need to be careful what I do in person because whatever I do, the internet can view it and distort it in ways that most people who weren't there aren't going to understand what really happened. So it was a very big learning curve and experience for me when I realized how context and internet and data gets lost as time goes on. And the internet can just say, hey, did you guys see Rudy over here taking a picture? And this, this, this wife and this child, and he was taking a picture with them? And he took money and charged them? And, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And then I learned very quickly that I got to be very careful associating and this was one of the biggest reasons I never took sponsorships on this channel. Because as time goes on, you don't know how it can turn on you. And I was always very scared of that kind of twist on things that you didn't know was coming. So that was a good learning curve there. Um, over here, we got the fake 1980s cell phone. That's always just a funny thing because, again, the old brick phones, it, it just makes a good video. It, it always has. We got the fake taco. Because, again, you guys know my favorite thing is tacos. Um, over here, we got more stop tape. Uh, now, over here is interesting. So, we've got the USSR uh, a long time ago in the early days of this channel. I did a, a sub video series called Russian Rudy. And where I would, I would talk really like I just got off. I, like, I had, you know, I, I had some, I don't know if I can do it good anymore. Well, Russian Rudy was very into doing shady things. Like, I, I made, I tried to do this Russian Rudy thing. And I had this fake piece of paper, and I would light it with fire to act like I'm smoking this piece of paper. And I had a Fallen Empires pack on it, and I thought nothing symbolized, like, this, this Russian Rudy with an accent and Fallen Empire. I thought it was a funny thing. And back in 2016 and 17, it was a really, people loved it. I got requests all the time to keep doing them. I think I did two or three of these Russian Rudy videos about eight, seven to eight years ago. It's been a long time. Obviously... The world back then and today is very, very different. Today, I think we're if just saying the word Russian will probably ban this channel or demonetize and everything. We went through all this censorship and things changed from when I started this channel in 2016 all the way through to the, the political stuff, the religious stuff, then the Donald Trump stuff, and then the censorship, the adpocalypse. Anybody remember the adpocalypse on YouTube? We went through all these phases of evolution in the social media and YouTube where now... I can't do a lot of certain things and funny stuff I did at the beginning because the censorship and algorithm and banning and everything, the world became very sensitive to a lot of topics and cultural shifts, especially post-COVID, post-2020, all these eras and the shutdown of the country, the vaccine era, the, the Black Lives Matter thing, you had the, the country shut down, you had riots and protesting, now we have wars all over the world. You had all these phases. Oh, that was the time too. Remember Magic and Wizards um, uh, banned some of the cards? So the country and the world went through all these phases. And here we are in 2024. So this little thing came from me making a video a long time ago talking about Russian Rudy. And it was, it was just a funny thing and a lot of people loved it. If you do remember in that Russian Rudy video, I also had a bunch of Command and Conquer video games. 
uh, and Command and Conquer Red Alert and all these old video games. It was a really fun thing from years ago. So that's what that came from. Uh, over here, um, we got to mention it. We got to mention it. So we also have a little love letter here from Mr. Bronson, which came from a years ago in Flesh and Blood on Bronson YouTube. And behind it, we have the world famous Kaladesh Invention Box. Now, this was probably one of the most followed dramatic stories and subsets I ever did on this YouTube channel. Um, and this was essentially, for those of you who weren't around, um, I hid this box. No matter where I went, every YouTube video in 2017, where I did a discussion, every non-box opening video, I took this box and hid it in the background, similar to Sarah Angel and things like that. This box was hidden somewhere in the background. Many times you can only see a little portion of it or something. I had this box hidden everywhere I went. And this was back when, when Mark Rosewater said every magic set forever was going to have Masterpiece lottery cards moving forward. And that's when I realized that Masterpieces and flashy cards was over with. This was in 2017. And then a year later, I said, well, on October 1st, 2018, I'll reveal what's in the box. And we did this funny thing. And long story short, um, I just bought a bunch of Masterpiece cards and I bought the boxes and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't recommend doing mass box openings and things like that anymore. And that was the end of the Rudy mass box opening era. That was where I, I shut down my mass box opening in 2018, 2017. After many, many years of doing mass box opening on Gate Crash, Dragon's Maze, Cons of Tarkir, Fate Reforged, Dragons of Tarkir, Core 2012, Core 2013, Core 2014, Core 2015, Conspiracy 1, Conspiracy 2, I can't remember, but I did mass box openings on all these sets. Created a huge single card empire business that I was running through eBay. And um, I only did it part time. And it was doing really well. I think I was making about $2,000 a month just selling single cards that were commons and uncommons. It was efficient. I had it really well done. And that was the end of that era. I shut the whole thing down. I moved forward with YouTube, Patreon, and sealed product. Um, looking back, I guess my timing was very good because of the shift of flashy cards into I didn't I never in a million years thought Hasbro and Wizards would go into a game piece era and destroy their own brand. I, I never in a million years saw that coming. So that's the story with that. Okay, so we got some other interesting thing. Uh, Beanie Baby number two, I think not Princess Di wait Princess Diana. Um, what was this Beanie Baby number two? Oh wait, hold on. Hold on. Uh, okay, uh, Andrew S. Thank you for all your help and everything. Uh, your bookcase, uh, Princess Diana Beanie Baby. Um, so I have include, I have sent you this exclusive Queen Elizabeth II Beanie Baby to add to your collection. So these are my two Beanie Babies. Thanks, Andrew. So we've had this up here, um, and honestly, another patron. What do you all sent me? This, I guess, three D printed. I think homemade or 3D printed? 2020 dumpster fire for how messed up the world in the line in the sand of 2020 and how the world would never be the same. And I've left this ever since. We've always had to have the dumpster fire. And yes, if you actually go online and hit dumpster on fire, there are actually videos on the internet from the 2020 era <clears throat> where there are actually dumpsters in a flood, in a natural disaster, on fire, floating down the street. And that's where it came from. So we got that. That's the history there. Pretty cool stuff there. Um, in the background, I don't know if you can see it. We have Inquest. Can you see that? There's an Inquest in a Scry magazine. Um, that symbolizes also uh, a lot of back in the day when people would get price quotes and things like that. A lot of it came from magazines. And it was a really, that was a way to learn and know your prices and be a part of it. And um, part of me misses those days because... That leads me to the next thing, which is people always comment, well, Rudy, you know, it took 20 years for magic to go up in value. You know, flesh and blood went up in value in two years. And, you know, I always want to tell you all the context in comparing things like that are you cannot do that. Because back in these days, information flowed slowly. By the time you knew prices went up, you had to wait a month for a price guide and for somebody to tell you. Well, we are in the modern digital age. 
things move quicker. What they call the velocity or the rate of change um, is accelerated and you can't compare that to things from the 80s or the 90s or things like that. So you have to understand the rate of change comparing historical data to previous explosive things is very, it doesn't line up perfectly. There's similars, there, there, there's similarities, and there's things that don't line up. But overall, the context of the world is very different. So that's important to remember, everybody. So let's, let's go over here. Down here, we have a Magic the Gathering book, not in English. This was given to me from Tavis King. Um, we got a giggity sticker because the woman is topless and her boobs are out. And I didn't want to be demonetized on YouTube. So he thought that I would love a Magic the Gathering book. They had beautiful women that are absolutely gorgeous works of art and amazing, beautiful, beautiful living organisms of our modern times. And of course, it's Magic the Gathering. And of course, Wizards and Hazard would never make anything like this in modern times. And beauty, and especially women of beauty, is apparently a very taboo thing where, you know, I, similar to sorcery, the card game and things going on, um, I am a very old-fashioned believer that Women and their beauty should be respected and absolutely adored. And I think men who have giant muscles and are very healthy should also be respected and, and be impressed upon. I think it goes both ways where men and women, when they are healthy and they are a, a good genes and health and specimen, whether you're a male or female, you know, when someone something is beautiful, it should be respected and appreciated. I've always had that belief because I've seen guys out there that I'm like, damn, that guy, look how good that guy looks. I mean, I wish I looked that good. You guys see me comment that all the time on cards. Same thing. There are women out there that I'm like, holy hell, was she like photoshopped? Is that woman real? So it kind of, you know, there is just natural beauty from the way life is. And I don't think it gets enough appreciation in the world. So that's what that is. Over here also we got a duelist, another magazine similar to Scry and Quest. Uh, we also have, uh, what do we got over here? Oh, off to the side. We have a Taco Bell employee and manager hat that actually some Taco Bell employees sent me in the past. So thought that was kind of funny. Uh, we have some other things back here. Um, again, we got more counterfeit cards where somebody was upset that Beckett wouldn't grade their fake dual land. Which actually, I can give you guys uh, some funny things too. Um, since even being a part of Premier Card Grading, PCG, and we moved to the Florida from Channel Fireball and took over the rights and everything. Um, I think we're at four... I think in the last two months alone, we've had four orders and four submissions of four different customers that have tried to submit counterfeit magic cards. Uh, all magic cards. Counterfeit magic to get graded and slabbed by PCG. Now remember, um, most of the check-in process at PCG. I don't have time to sit there and grade all your cards and do all that shit. I, I don't have time for that. But when orders and customer stuff is checked into the system... I try to kind of, I, I glance through it all to make sure that we don't have any counterfeit cards. That's something I do try to keep an eye on because I can glance, I can see old cards and things very quickly and I can tell when something's off. And I can tell you all, the company so far, we've caught four orders in the last 45, 60 days with PCG of people trying to submit fake Power 9, fake Dual Lands, fake Urza's cards, fake Foils, and uh, yeah, obviously they didn't get graded. So... That's the overall big stuff there. Uh, some other things. Bow tie. Because you got to look smart. There's a lot of books behind here that people have asked. Uh, back in the corner, if you guys can see, there's Marilyn Monroe's face back there. Um, I was always a fan of Marilyn Monroe, of her beauty and everything. She just has that natural, old world, 1950s Americana beauty. Some people call it like the pinup girl, 1950s Americana. And I've always been fascinated with that culture. Um <clears throat> At the same time, I've always been intrigued by Marilyn Monroe's life because she was such a beautiful power woman. But at the same time, her life was a disaster and a lot of tragic things happened. So I find someone who was so beautiful and seemed to have the world in her hands and had so much power. She was like an alpha female, you know, very powerful woman. But at the same time, was plagued with troubles and terrible, some abusive bad men and Terrible people took advantage of her with physically, sexually, uh, financially, money and family. And it was fascinating to me to see someone at that level who's so historical. But when you really know them or research them in real life, not really know them personally. But when you research someone on a deeper level, you realize how wrong you can be on who someone is. 
And I always found that really, really fascinating. Um, a lot of the other books, too, back here. Uh, over here, we got Rudy's, one of Rudy's favorite books, The Black Swan. We got David and Goliath, Tipping Point. We got a lot of funny, we got Fight Club books back here. We got all kinds of uh, love and war. We got WTF books. We've got weird philosophical books. We got some old 1800 books over here. Um, mostly the books, same thing over there. Frank Sinatra, I'm always a huge Frank Sinatra, Rat Pack, 1950s era. Always been fascinated with the old world of Vegas and old business and different styles of things that went on, good, bad, and corruption. I've always been fascinated with the history of those kind of things. Um, I, did I miss anything major? I feel like overall... Oh, can you guys see up here? The Bull and Bear. Okay, here, hold on. We're at the end of the video. Nobody cares anymore. Holy shit, so I'm sorry. 45 minutes. I'm going to end the video here. Up there is a brass statue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it down. Hold on. I'm going to get it down. I'm covered in dust. Oh, my God. It's covered in dust. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. It's... Hold on. Uh, can we... Oh my god, it's Oh my god, I gotta clean this. It's completely covered in dust. So this bull and bear statue was given to me by my parents when I got my first brokerage job as a licensed stockbroker. I worked at Merrill Lynch, okay? And they got me this as a gift to put on my desk in the brokerage firm. So when I started doing real jobs and had a real job, this was the, the bullish Rudy long-term, always attacking the bear to always push forward into the future. And no matter how bad things seem, the sun will come out the next day and you never, ever give up. And if you maintain a strong mindset, you take care of yourself, you have good people around you, no matter how bad it is, no matter how scary the bear is, the sun will come out tomorrow and you will find a way forward. And things are never as bad as they seem. And... Um, it's a very special piece. I've never talked about that before, and that's the first time I've ever said on this YouTube channel that I worked in Merrill Lynch. That's all I got. Thank you all for the support and kindness. Thanks for the patrons. Um, you're the reason that I'm here and able to devote the time to do this stuff. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah and Festivus for the rest of us.